Welcome, Eagles, to another episode of Trad Cat Night Radio. I am Eric Gajewski, founder and owner of Trad Cat Night, the most viewed and followed traditional Catholic apostolate worldwide. This is also home to the new crusade. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I have a returning special guest, Father Richard Voigt. Father has been with us. He's done at least three or four talks with us now, and it's always good to get him back on. Always good for me, too, to take a break with these radio shows and get back to the most important things, which is the faith. And today, we're going to be covering, if I'm not mistaken, the seven sorrows. And this devotion was passed along by St. Bridget. Uh, There are seven graces uh, attached uh, to souls who honor uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary by saying the seven Hail Marys and meditating upon her sorrows uh, daily. Uh, It's something that's dear to Father Voigt's heart, and quite honestly, the past few months I haven't done so well in this area. So this is good, kind of a, a little kick in the butt for me to get, uh, you know, to go back and, and, and reacquaint myself with this devotion. Uh, it was, if I'm not mistaken, approved by Pius VII in 1815. Um, and I, well, I'll just let Father Voigt go into this because I don't want to cut too much into his talk. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over to Father. Maybe Father can. Lead us in prayer as usual, and we will get talking about this wonderful devotion that we have in the church that so many of us are are missing out on. So, Father, without further ado. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. We turn to our Blessed Mother, for we are her children, and we ask her to send the Holy Ghost upon each one of us who are listening to this reflection upon her sorrows that she in the Holy Ghost may continue to give us a deeper insight into the truth that is Catholic that makes us holy and unites us in Christ our Lord so together we pray hail Mary full of grace the Lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb Jesus holy Mary mother of God pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mother of Sorrows, pray for us. I want to tell you from the very beginning that I'm taking this from the spiritual perspective that the seven sorrows have a particular process that bring the soul to perfection. And so it's important to take each one step by step because the first step in our own spiritual life is that of the imitation of Our Lady. For instance, the first sword that pierces Our Lady's heart we know is when she enters into the temple called the presentation of Jesus. And in that presentation, Simeon is guided there by the Holy Ghost and he sees the salvation of his people, the salvation of each soul you and I possess. And so he says to her, this child is destined for the rise and fall of many and your own soul a sword shall pierce the first sword is this word from simeon that our blessed mother is the one who knows better than anyone else every prophecy concerning her son this alone would be a sorrow and that is why it initiates the sorrows what is it then that brings us into the spiritual life. It is this from the sorrow of Our Lady, anticipation. Each one of us has to realize that we are going to enter into a spiritual union with God, and hence there is this anticipation of what will take place within our lives. If we are going to follow Jesus, then we must follow him on the path that is the cross. And our Blessed Mother is the primary Catholic, the first, the greatest honor of our race. And so she gives us, first of all, the anticipation known to her through the prophets. And so she knows Isaiah. She knows Jeremiah. She knows what is taking place. Now, she could be afraid. As Gabriel said to her, do not fear Mary. Mary is a little bit unique because of her purity, her innocence, and her motherhood. You and I must realize that 
we have a tendency to allow fear to dominate in our own lives. There is a fear of imminent disaster right now that overshadows the entire world. The whole notion of a third world war, we cannot fathom what it would be like. We know the prophecies concerning three quarters of the world being annihilated. We know our Blessed Mother told us that unless Russia is consecrated to the Immaculate Heart, why entire nations would be obliterated. We can't imagine that happening. And so there is a sense of fear in the world today. This fear penetrates the very bones of our physical society. And this is witnessed by the 9-11 event. So we know, each one of us, that there is a fear, and this fear is not created, but rather sterilizes, because it's a fear that is brought on by the demonic. Sure. There is a fear that is reverential, and there is that fear that allows Mary no longer to be controlled by it, but rather to give us the way to command it and demand it. And so there is survival, not uh, in a certain sense via the machinations of politics and politicians, but their survival in and through union with the pattern that our Blessed Mother gives us in her life in this world. So the world and its fear create sterility. That is why we see young ladies basically pregnant, pregnant and yet afraid to give birth. And so what do they do? To get rid of the fear, they destroy the child that is within their womb. God did never, never told us that we should be fruitful and sterilized, but rather that we should be fruitful and multiply. Mm. Yeah. Hence, we have a situation in which women, who should be the fruitful ones in our society, lifting up the life of their children, they are the ones who, because of fear, have turned to sterilizing themselves. In the first sword, our blessed mother says that we will conquer the fear by fertility. You and I can be fruitful physically, generally because father, loving mother, generates the child, and the child is the fruit of their love. In the spiritual life, we generate children by means of the word, the word that I'm communicating to you may cause you to open your mind and heart and through the perception of a new truth say give birth to christ in a new way in your life this would be spiritual fecundity who alone in your mind's eye is the most fruitful of all women when you ask yourself that question you have to say that ultimately it's our blessed mother in the physical order, she gave birth to our Lord Jesus Christ through the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost. In the spiritual order, she becomes our mother in and through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we were given upon that cross to her a new nuptial, a new Adam and a new Eve. And you and I become the conditioned children of our Lord and our Lady. It is the order of grace, the supernatural order. It is the order in which we are battling for right now. Because the Jew has confused this world with the naturalism that says everything has to be seen and touched and heard. And if we don't see, touch, or hear it, it doesn't exist. This type of mentality destroys the spirit of an individual because it destroys their destiny. And ultimately, their destiny is to be children of God. And hence, we have to follow the pattern Our Lady lets down for us. Remember Simeon prophesying, A sword shall pierce thy heart. It caused a shudder to go down our Blessed Mother's spine because that would certainly remind her of every prophecy concerning this son that she would bear that she has born. Now, it is not 
able, this fear, is not able to paralyze the fiat. So the fear is controlled by the fiat voluntas tua. I will accept the providence of God, for the providence of God will rule the world. How can she sing one of Israel's songs knowing the extent to which evil would abuse the soul of her heart, her own son? How could she sing that Magnificat unless she knew that there was something beyond this world, a destiny that calls each and every heart that was called into this existence by the love of the Father? You and I realize that we are in a battle, and the battle is for our soul, that each one of us, by the preferential love of the Father, was then called, selected, and chosen for these days, days that are the end of the fifth age, the age of chastisement. We yearn for now the age of our Blessed Mother, the age of consolation. We cannot achieve that age unless we first of all anticipate. I was teaching young people how important it is to obey your father and mother. It is the fourth commandment. In the fourth commandment, there are four promises attached. First, honor thy father and thy mother, and you shall have a long life. First promise, you will have a long life because you have honored your father and your mother. Second, honor your father and mother, and you shall have children that will honor and obey and love you. Because as you sow, thus you shall reap. Yeah. If you so honor and love for your parents, you will reap honor and love in your children. Third, honor and obey your father and mother, and you shall have peace in your heart, your mind, your soul. In other words, obedience begets peace. And finally, honor your father and mother, and you shall enter the kingdom of heaven, because you have honored me in them, thus says the Lord. This obedience of our blessed mother to the fiat indicates the crucial notion that you and I must foster in our own life and in the life of our families. It is this, the providence of God rules the world. Each and every history book that you might pick up written by seculars, history in them is accidental. One thing just accidentally happens after the other. For the Catholic, history is providential. God has everything in his hands. The Father selected you and I to enter into this world at this particular time for a purpose. We may not know exactly what that purpose is, but if we fall into the fiat of our Blessed Mother, we will achieve that purpose indirectly because God will use us and we will not even understand how he used us, but he used us and hence we humble ourselves. We know that it's he who is doing it, not we who are doing it. In the essence of our Blessed Mother's first sword, it is indicative that she has a uniqueness in her nature. For our Blessed Mother is both mother and maiden. As a maiden, she is innocent. You take a child and, and you deal with a child and ask that child questions. That little child will accept anybody and everybody. It has no qualms of conscience being open to adults. That's the innocence of our Blessed Mother. This innocence begets the child Jesus. Then she becomes mother. And the mother has the pain and sorrow of giving birth. The mother has the wisdom of suffering. And hence, this uniqueness of mother and maiden are combined in our Blessed Mother. And so the first sword penetrates into this nature and gives to our Blessed Mother a personality that achieves courage in the face of all opposition. And that is why Satan is so upset with everything that our Blessed Mother has as a privilege. That is why the five first Saturdays we offer reparation for the blasphemies against Our Lady's purity and the gifts that she has been given to us, given to her by God. Now, 
let's move to a particular point of this movement in the first sword of our Blessed Mother. It is this movement where she experiences the ugliness, the pain, the sorrows that would come upon her son because of a world that has fallen under the auspices of original sin. Take for an example, in my life, I knew a mother who had one son. That son was a friend of mine. And that one son, she treasured and wanted to save that boy's soul, such a good mother. And she contracted cancer. They tried everything to save her. But one prayer was in her heart and in on her lips. And that was that her son might save his soul. They might not go to the streets if she passed. When she died, the sorrow in that young man, the sorrow in his father, broke up the family in a certain sense. And one day, who, this good friend of mine uh, had a motorcycle. We had motorcycles to get to high school. He was going home, taking a left turn when he was struck. Before he had even graduated, he was on the road to being one of the cool guys. He had money and everything else. But her prayer, I'm sure, asked God not to allow him to lose his soul. That mother from eternity took her son and, in that real way, saved that soul. Now, recently, about two years ago, there was a story. Now, just yesterday, I heard of a story of a two-year-old down there in Florida who was in the water, and the gator came and grabbed, and that was the end of that child. Yeah. But two years ago, there was a little... You heard that, huh? You heard, yeah, uh, I did. Yeah. Anyway, there were two years ago... Yeah. Two years ago, a, a similar story came out in the papers in Florida. A young man asked his mother to go to allow him to go out and play in the tide pool, and the mother had a window looking right out there and could see the tide pool and see the little boy and everything was very good. She continued working on and she kept watching her boy when all of a sudden she saw a motion to the right. She began to cry out, Gator, Gator, Gator. She ran to get to her son. She pushed open that screen door. A neighbor heard, heard her keep calling Gator, Gator. She jumped in that tide pool and grabbed her son's arms just as she was going to pull him out. That gator got his legs. And the legs were being stretched. The arms were being stretched. So mama and gator were in a tug of war with the little boy in the middle. The neighbor came with his gun, began shooting at the gator. The gator let the boy go torn. The mother went with the neighbor, got in the car, and took the boy to the hospital there, she gave her own skin to help patch up her son. Six months later, the news came to this home to interview the boy. And after interviewing the boy and what was, I guess you consider, his experience and what it felt like and all that kind of answer questions and so forth, the interviewer looked at the boy and said, could you be a good fella and show me the scars? The boy looked at the man and said, I'll show you my scars. I'll show you the scars. And he lifted up his arms. He says, they're the scars of my mom's hands. My mom would not let that gator take me. My mom wrestled and took me out of the, the mouth of that gator. And I thought, how beautiful that was. That is exactly what our Blessed Mother is doing for us today. She's holding on to our, her sons and daughters' arms, not allowing that, that serpent, not allowing that gator to destroy and tear us apart. And she imprints upon our arms that fingerprint of love, that wonderful grip, grip that will pull us into eternity. And this is why we say that our, she is our mother. And this gift that God has given to her in that first sword means that she will take the sufferings the difficulty, she will give us her skin. She will do whatever she can to bring us to the salvation that God the Father wants of us. 
In the eternal love, remember, the third act of God, the Father's love for us after preferring us and selecting us, is that he accepts being wounded by our sins. And those sins today are wounding the Father's heart deeply. And so the Father's heart from all time cries out, Whom might I send? And from all times the voice of his son cried out, Father, send me. Now the question is, Komodo, how might I send you, son? I must find one who's so pure, so innocent, so worthy, that she will give birth, give you a human nature. And hence, this is where the sense of pain comes in for Our Lady. She who is the humblest of us all is asked to be the exalted Queen of Queens, for she gives birth to the King of Kings. She's so humble, so good, that this pains her. And knowing that she, as an individual, will give birth to this child, this child will give birth to each one of us, and will give to us his own mother to guide us through. So this is why we say in this first sword, we focus upon the word anticipation that mothers anticipate the sorrows and difficulties of each and every child that they give birth to. I just think of my own mother and how she'd sit up with us and when we were sick, she would not go to bed, she would take care of us and so forth. She had her family as the first thing and that's most important. Her life didn't matter. Now, she has got a stroke and her children surround her and love her and do whatever they can to help her. This is why we say anticipation. You have to anticipate, you have to realize in your spiritual life, you're going to have a cross. You're going to have the sorrows that Our Lady endured, and those sorrows are not meant to crush you, but those sorrows are meant to strengthen you. Now, this perfect union, this perfect love, will cast out all fear. For what greater love can there be than that one should lay down one's life for another? And that's what our Blessed Mother consented to, that her son would lay down his life, that each and every soul that enters into this world may have the opportunity, the potential, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. We can be free, each one of us, of our fears today, that we turn to the model given us by God. God's patterns are presented in scriptural lives. In Mary, we find the pattern to conquer our fear and perfect our love and live in the ultimate trust of God's divine providence. That, that, that is the pattern. Now, it's up to each one of us to accept and trust the pattern and realize there are no accidents in our life. Everything is meant for our sanctification and our salvation. Hence, we turn to the wisdom of our mother that teaches us of the power and the mercy of God. Through the shedding of his blood, we have the power to be forgiven and to forgive others. We cannot give, but we do not have. Forgiveness of our sins begets our ability to forgive others' sins. And then, that divine blood gives us the ability to find the mercy we desperately desire. Surely, the dangers are ever-present in a visioned world like ours. It can blow at any moment, this world. We know it. Yet we see through our Blessed Mother's eyes to the ultimate hope, our resurrection, our eternal life. Is this not seen in every mother's eyes when they gaze upon the miracle of a new life and the birth of their child? In this we come to possess Mary's trust. She is in us, and we are in her, confident of the victory. In the end, her immaculate heart will triumph. Now, that is the motherhood of Mary. What about her innocence, the maiden? Can we even come near that purity after we have so defiled ourselves by sin? In our Blessed Mother's innocence, Mary feared the cross that would shed the last drop of her son for her. But she would also fear the sins that caused the necessity of this crucifixion. We can come to unite with the maiden's divine fear of sin. We can reflect upon the terror 
that our sins continue to produce in this world due to our rejection of the divine plan. Just think about it. In our world today, the original sin syndrome is amassing itself in such a way that there's nothing more that you and I can do, humanly speaking. We can only do one thing, and that is trusting prayer that our Blessed Mother will finally receive that which God the Father intended for her, that Russia be consecrated to her immaculate heart, and that everyone will know that it is that purity, that innocence, that maidenness that brought about the sanctification and the peace that this world desires. We have too many of our Catholic brothers and sisters who deny the plan of God for their salvation and form a plan of their own making. They deny their fears, their distrust, their division. It does not have to be that way. In imitation of the innocence of the maiden, we can return to a healthy fear of sin through holy confession and well-prepared holy communions which apply the blood of the Lamb to the door of every soul created in the image and likeness of God. You and I can save a soul every day, knowing that in and through the sacrifices that we make, the pain that we have in our own life, physically, mentally, spiritually, everything can be offered to Almighty God to save a soul. We have only to make that intention each and day, and that is what purifies our hearts, too is that we seek to save a soul, we begin to live as Catholics. We are meant to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Hence, the, in, the purity that comes from seeking to save souls rather than to do our own thing. So we now seek not our self-satisfaction, but rather the glory of God. Through the maiden experiences, souls like St. Paul, St. Augustine, St. Mary Magdalene regain their innocence and their aversion for sin. From their aversion, they become attached to a compulsive love that bears fruit in eternal ways. The growth of that love draws the soul more deeply into the depths of fruitfulness. Around these saints, eternal joy attracts others. These souls desire to have the same thing that a St. Paul has or a St. John Bosco, or St. Francis of Assisi. All of these men had power to attract others to holiness. And that holiness ends in purity of heart, soul, and action. Goodness will always diffuse itself. It gives without counting the cost. A mother hen does not count the effort it takes to bring food to her hungry chicks. The rain does not our largest sin for refreshing the parched earth. Our Lord reminds us that as we have received freely, so we should give freely. Yes, you and I can conquer the stifling fear in our world by turning to this first sword that pierced our Blessed Mother's heart and know that in the end, it is the skin of the Lamb, the shedding of His blood that covers us, heals us, and gives us the power to go forward in this life. This is the anticipation of the first sword that pierced our Blessed Mother's heart. It is solved by the two aspects of Our Lady's nature, to be mother, the wisdom, sorrow, suffering, and to be maiden, innocent, just so ready to accept and be like a little child and receive like when I was teaching these little kids that just encouraged me every day to go there and be bathed in innocence, their innocence. And it really was a refreshing experience for me. Now we move to the second solar part. It is called the flight into Egypt. Remember, the angel Gabriel appears to St. Joseph and says to him, take the child and its mother, flee into Egypt. Again, here's the prophecy. We have the anticipation in the first sword. Now we have that which is important. We have now the action of detachment. Now God begins his motion. Anticipation leads to detachment. I no longer care about what I want, 
I now care about what God wants and what gives God ultimate glory. And so leave everything in the middle of the night, in the dark places. We leave everything. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus flee to protect the divine life. In your spiritual life, all things come to you after you detach yourself from them. This gift of leaving everything behind and going into a pagan environment is prophetically given to us through our blessing. Remember, God used flights in the case of Abraham. Leave your country. Go into the country of Canaan. There will establish you as a great nation. Moses flees from Pharaoh to become just a simple shepherd and then is chosen by God to lead his people out of bondage. These flights are prophetic. You and I will have to flee. Flee from that which makes us worldly. Flee from that which makes us sinful. We cannot move out of the purgative life if we have any attachment. And therefore, the first sword is the sword of anticipation. The second is the sword of detachment. I cut everything away from me. I get rid of anything that holds me into this world to the flesh or to the devil. Every personality has to pass through this detachment. That is why in the spiritual life, we say you have to get rid of any attachment and seek the glory of God in order to move from the purgative life into the illuminative life. And so Mary and Jesus and Joseph flee into the dark, into the world of paganism, into that which we would say boggles the mind, because now among a pagan people, alone, without anything, because she, they took nothing with them, there they begin their life as a family, the Holy Family. And so this question comes to us, that if there is a personality, it is a personality only to the extent it is responsible for its salvation. You and I are persons to the extent that we take responsibility for our life. Therefore, when we look at the world today, we see that what Satan is trying to do is eliminate personhood. Individuals no longer take responsibility for what they say. Take a Hillary Clinton. She sets up men in Benghazi to die and then hides from the fact that she is responsible as Secretary of State for the fact that she did not take the steps in order to protect our ambassador, or to protect our Americans. And now she goes forward as the heartthrob of the women, the heartthrob of the liberals, and she desires to rule the world from the presidency of the United States. She's not a person. She's a demon. And so we see the demonic coming out of people today because they will not take responsibility for what they have done. They can murder, they can cheat, they can steal, they can have abortions, they can uh, be adulterers. It doesn't matter. Evil doesn't matter anymore. What matters is a person who tries to stand up and say, you should not kill. You should not cheat your neighbor. You should not uh, have an adulterous relationship or fornicate and so forth. You should not do it. Because it destroys the personhood, your personhood. You are a source of responsibility. And to the extent that you save your soul, you are taking God seriously. In the second sword, we now realize the importance of detachment in our life. If we realize it, then we will begin to live and we will begin to imitate our Blessed Mother. Tell me. In your life, have you ever experienced the fact that you got into something that you shouldn't have got into and you said, what am I doing this for? The devil is a very cunning individual. And that devil realizes that the more he can attach you to doing evil, 
seeking the pleasures of this world, seeking the power of this world, the more he will then destroy that which is most important in your life, and that is to become a soul that is saved. The soul that is saved passes into the illuminative life through the detachment. The illuminative life allows you to see the truth so clearly that you begin to beget truth in your life. Consider this. We have been fostering error in the church. Error has come from the Pope, cardinals, bishops, any priests, and even lay people. Error is part and parcel of what is being taught in the, in the modern church today, the Church of the Council. Error begets death. Error is sin. When an individual follows the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ, that individual grows in innocence and detaches himself or herself from the world from the opinion of the world, from the goods of the world. And thus becomes more attuned to living in eternity now. This is why the flight is so important. The flight leads you to attach yourself correctly to your eternal end. And this is what Mary and Joseph are doing. They're attaching themselves to the child they protected, Jesus. The divine light is represented in him. They now are attached to eternity. They will never give up this gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will never, ever separate themselves from him. And so it is with each one of us. To med med meditate upon the sorrow of our Blessed Mother, the second sword, is to realize how important it is to struggle and to accept the difficulties of this world the condemnations of individuals, and yet hold firm to the fact that I want to save my soul. I want to get to heaven. Just as I seek to save a soul every day in my prayer and my sacrifice, so by doing that I know I am including my own soul. That as I save another soul, so my, uh, my soul is sanctified and salvation is closer to me. Let us move now into the third sword that pierced our Blessed Mother's heart. In the third sword, our Lord is lost. Now, this is important to realize. Many people have meditated upon it. I think the greatest meditation comes out of one good father, Gerald Bond. In his reflection upon the third sword, he says that we have moved from anticipation through detachment to abandonment. Abandonment. Mary and Joseph had taken Jesus to the feast of the Passover. On the way back, they think that our Lord is with the other person because men traveled separately from the women. And now they've come together and they find out that Jesus is not there. They immediately look among their friends and relatives and no one has seen him. He is lost. They have returned to Jerusalem and for three days, three nights, they cannot find him. Finally, they return to the temple and find him speaking to the elders, asking them questions, speaking and learning. And Our Lady says, Son, your father and I have been seeking you in sorrow. Why? Why have you done this to us? Our Lord says, How is it you sought me? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? Now think. Abandonment. Anticipation first. Detachment second. And now the pattern goes on. You must experience what Jesus is going to experience in saving souls. On the cross, what did our Lord say to his father? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mary must pass through the abandonment that her son would experience. 
She is the one who shares everything. That is why we say she co-suffered. She has compassion. In the Vatican Council too, there was a group of cardinals and bishops who said we want to give honor to our Blessed Mother by saying that she is the co-mediatrix of all graces. It should have been done. She is the one to whom all graces come in and through her son Jesus. And what God has given to her, she desires to give to each one of her children, you and I. We will have to pass through a band. Your father and I have been searching for you in sorrow. Abandonment leads to attachment on the divine level. There is a book called The Cloud of Unknowing, written by a mystic. In The Cloud of Unknowing, there is the pattern that says that after one has detached oneself, one will pass through a cloud, like when we fly in the air and we go through these clouds. I can't see anywhere, can't see anything. It's like you're in a blank sphere. The cloud of unknowing. I don't know what God is doing. I don't know why he has abandoned me. I don't know what this suffering is all about. But I trust him. That is why we established it in the first sword. The anticipation tells me I must anticipate the providence of God doing things that I can't imagine. I never would have imagined how he has moved me in my life. I never expected to be here where I'm at now. I thought I would continue teaching geometry, algebra to the high school kid till the day I died. But that wasn't what was in the plan of God. So we abandon ourselves to this will. In his will, as Dante say, says in his Paradiso, is our peace. Whatever he wills, that is where our peace is. Obedience begets peace. And so, the more I fiat voluntas tua, thy will be done, the more I can incorporate that into my spiritual life, the more I can accept the abandonment that will come to me in and through the pattern that God has established. So, we have a specific poem that is quite beautiful. It questions us, hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? No scar on hand, foot, or side, or hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail your ascending star. Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archer spent, leaning against a tree, and with ravaging beasts that compass me, I swoon. Hast thou no wound? Yet as the master, so the disciple shall be, and pierced are the hands and feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Can he have followed far who has no wound, no scar? Abandonment, acceptance of the cross of our Lord, acceptance of the wounds. We do not understand. We do not. We go through a cloud of unknowing, but we realize in the depths of our heart that we have established a pattern. We will trust him. We will put our hands in the hands of our Blessed Mother. We know that they are holding on to our soul with all the power in their grip. And we will find our way to our family. And that is why we say that every word that comes forth from the mouth of God is a word that gives us greater encouragement and destiny. What are we being, what are we asking then in this third sword? We're asking to conquer our selfishness, our possessiveness. For it is we who often cling to what we want. Our will is dominant in so many different ways. We play games, but we, we say we want to do what God wants to do. But when it's difficulty and it causes pain, we want our convenience, we want our comfort, we want our complacency. And so in this third sword, we are being cut, torn away from all those things which can disturb the spiritual life. We begin to realize that 
It is in him, Jesus Christ, that we find the pattern that our Blessed Mother followed and that we too will follow. I would like to reflect upon this particular aspect that we have in our world today a great deal of jealousy, greed, possessiveness, you know, security, and so forth. We have insurance programs. We all want to make security our God. And in reality, it's its abandonment that sets us free. It's the abandonment that says, don't worry about whether or not you can get that or this. Don't worry about your insurance. Don't worry about your home. Don't worry about anything. Worry only about achieving the sanctity that God wants you to achieve. This is why our Lord said, Do you not know I must be about my Father's business? What is the business of our Lord Jesus Christ if not to save our souls? Hence, he is there to present the truth in the temple, to open the mind of the, the, the ones who should recognize him as a Savior, and rec they must recognize the truth of Scripture. This then teaches us that we can move from the third sword into that fourth sword. The fourth sword. Jesus meets our Blessed Mother. And what happened? We jump from that age of 12 through, through his, his, his earthly life in Nazareth to the crucifixion, to our Lord carrying a cross, to the the reality of the prophecies that she anticipated in the presentation. Now we have our Lord Jesus Christ walking on the way to Calvary. He's been scourged, he's been crowned with thorns, and he looks up at our Blessed Mother. And there's no consolation. There is no consolation that they cannot speak. Their eyes alone speak. Here is the sword of silence. Silence gives us the power to conquer the crucifixion of our nature. Our weak, human, frail nature must be crucified. It must carry the cross to Calvary. Our Blessed Mother is there to remind each one of us that she will give us the courage she will give us the grace and hence what is the grace that she gives to our lord jesus christ when their eyes meet it is this the will of god the father calls us to this moment it is the greatest moment this is the hour of your glorification satan has his time but his time is short and our lord jesus christ by his blood, by his obedience to the Father, and Our Lady, by her obedience as well, give us the power to conquer the evil one who threatens us in this day and age of ours. Have great confidence. Enter into silence every day. Meditate upon the seven sorrows of our Blessed Mother and look and see where you're at. Are you still back at anticipation? Are you in the detachment mode? Are you in now the abandonment mode? Or now have you passed from abandonment to silence and to recognizing that the will of God is dominant and it must be carried out in my life as it was carried out in our lady's life and our Lord's life. There's no room for self-pity. There's only room for the glory of God. That is why we are in this particular uh, stage. We have passed through the purgative life. We have entered into the ruminative life, and now we are moving toward the unitive life. In each one of these, we keep our eyes focused upon giving glory to God the Father, the Father who called his Son into being, and the Mother who gave him that human flesh. In humility, he was begotten. In humility, he is being crucified. And in humility, he will give us his body and blood as our food for our journey to eternal life. And so now we move to the fifth sword that pierced our blessed mother's heart. In the fifth sword, we realize that Jesus is on the cross. 
And below the cross stand three individuals, the three that will always be at the cross. First is purity, our Blessed Mother. Second is penitence, Mary Magdalene, at the foot of the cross. And third is priesthood, the one who will sacrifice and lay down his life and join our Lord Jesus Christ in offering that sacrifice for the salvation of the world. The fifth sword, woman, behold thy son son behold thy mother the word that our lord uses is the same word he used at the feast of cana in galilee Gune, woman he reaches back into the first garden the garden where adam and eve were born and in that garden the first nuptials remember man this woman is thy wife and until death, she will be one with you. And what God has joined together, let no man tear asunder. And so God has joined Jesus as a new Adam, with Mary as the new Eve. And there on the cross, the nuptials take place, and children are granted to the new Eve. She is the mother of all who want to join in the grace that leads to eternal life, into a friendship, a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the fifth is that which gives us great reflection, that from anticipation to detachment, from abandonment to silence, now we find fecundity, fertility. Fertility now becomes the mark. I will go forth and I will bear children as our Blessed Mother, I will give sons and daughters to our Lord Jesus Christ by preaching, by speaking the word of truth, and by showing by my example of love that this is more important than anything else in this world. My dad died on February 14th, the Feast of St. Valentine, and my dad wrote upon a sword a statement. He said to all of the members of my family, on this sword. Remember, the most important thing that you can do is to love each other and love your mother. And then he praises my mother for all that she has done, for the fidelity that she has shown, and so forth. And he says, I have told her so many times she is the best thing in my life. Well, we can say the same thing now. Our Lord Jesus Christ has given us his mother. And we know that his mother gives us the power to conquer the evil one. We are the heel of our mother. And we are to crush the serpent's head. And how do we do it? By following her and Jesus. In the virtue that is most important to us, humility. Accept and love humiliations. Remember, you have three movements in your spiritual life. The first movement is this. You must destroy, mortify your senses. Then you move to the heart. You must deny your heart all of its desires. Third, you must humble your mind. Yet you to realize that nobody can hurt dust. Never take offense and never give offense. And this is the sword that our Blessed Mother endures in this particular passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. She could have taken offense at those who condemned innocent blood. She did not. Instead, she listens to her son as he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. She too forgives. She too intercedes. The fifth sorrow, to take upon herself the pain of giving even the enemies of her son the power to learn to save their soul. Imagine that. I've told you that there are nine loves within the divine heart, God's heart. Three belong to the Father. We've mentioned them, the preference, the selection, and then the acceptance of being wounded by our sins. Three belong to the Son, the humiliation of incarnation, the humiliation of crucifixion, and the humiliation of Holy Communion, being our bread, our blood. And now we come to the Holy Ghost. Because these last two swords that pierce Our Lady's heart 
perfect her in the spirit. Her spiritual life is, is, is guided by the Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Ghost, first of all, convicts the world of sin by the crucifixion of the Son. We begin to realize how deeply sin has affected our human nature and how we have so often chosen our own way rather than God's way. We go to confession, we confess our sins, and now we experience the forgiveness of the Holy Ghost. As you have been forgiven, so you shall forgive, says the Holy Ghost. So the first love of the Holy Ghost is that we can, are convicted of our sins. Second, because we realize we need a Savior, we go to confession and we receive forgiveness. And that mercy now becomes the manner in which we deal with others. Then, the final and the most important action of one who is going toward the kingdom of heaven is to pray for those who will kill you. St. Stephen, there was Paul, or Saul, standing there as those Jews just threw the stones, slashed Stephen apart piece by piece with those stones, and what did he pray? Father, forgive them. Hold not this sin against them. He imitates our Lord Jesus Christ, the third act of the love of the Holy Ghost. And so we are now at that particular point, that we have been received by Almighty God in and through our Blessed Mother. She is the one whom we take into our heart. As Scripture says, John, from that moment on, took her into her, his own home. So we have taken her into our own heart, and she is the one that teaches us how to forgive as she gave forgiveness to those who killed her son. The sixth sword that pierced our blessed mother's heart. Remember, our Lord is taken down. He's dead. He's died. And he's placed in the arms of our blessed mother. We call that the pieta, because ultimately piety is what we must strive for in our eternal life. Piety is reverence for the eternal acceptance of the will of the mighty God. And there with her son beaten and broken and bruised and flesh hanging like purple rags upon his body, there he is in her arms. And she sees what that sin has done to him. She sees the depth of the penetration of evil. And what happens? She teaches us powerlessness. I was praying before an abortion clinic in Texas and the people were there and we were praying and praying I said look we are seeking God's help we are powerless we can't change these women we can't change these doctors only God by his power can change them but he has asked us to recognize our uselessness our powerlessness. And this is where the sixth sword pierces Our Lady's heart. It's powerlessness. To realize that when we are weak, it is then we are strong. Because then the flood of God's own life can enter into us. It's like becoming truly empty. And now that which is empty can be filled with something better than ever. And that's what happens. We have passed through anticipation. We have gone through detachment. We have gone through an abandonment. We have gone through silence. We have gone through the action of seeking to bring souls to God. And now we come to powerlessness. We have nothing that we ourselves can do or show. We have only the weakness. And that's why St. Paul, in praying to our Lord, saying, Lord, deliver me from this weakness. Deliver me from this nonsense that I am suffering and our Lord says my dear son in your weakness in your powerlessness my power reaches perfection in other words we become the instruments of God in this particular sick Lord because we know in our piety in our reverence for what God has done that we of ourselves can do nothing but in him we can do all things and so our blessed mother gives us that example of true piety. Her love of God, her love of the will of God, accepts the sufferings and the difficulties of seeing her son massacred. 
when we as individuals can accept that sword, then we begin to realize we are on the path to true union. We haven't not yet touched it, but we are moving toward it. And in that seventh sword that Our Lady endures, we find a true union that will come to us. It is the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was a hurried burial, but they used the anointments, all the oils, the fragrance, and so forth, and quickly buried our Lord because it was a holy Sabbath. It was the Passover Sabbath. And so our Lord enters the tomb to recreate. He becomes the seed, just like each one of us. We have a body, and that body will go to corruption and death. It is the seed that bears the soul. And the soul, when the body begins to wane, enters into a greater strength. And so our Lord, now it looks like his body is dead, gone, buried. What's happening? He is entering into that place where the souls were waiting. And he's conquering those souls and bringing them to the kingdom of heaven because he is now the key. The key is the blood that he shed for the forgiveness of sin. It is the key that has opened the kingdom of heaven to all those who long for it. And our Blessed Mother, she knows it. Our Blessed Mother endures the sorrow of now the absence of her son in the physical order, but the presence of her son in a spiritual way in all creation in all of the supernatural that we will sooner or later come to recognize in our own death. And now the supernatural reigns. No longer will we say that everything is simply natural, that death ends everything. Instead, we say it's the beginning of a new life. The resurrection opens up the tomb. You could not be Jews, you could not perfidious individuals keep him down, and you will not keep the church, the true church, down either, because that burial is only the moment that God has waited for to burst forth in an atomic blast of power, a power of love that will crush and knock everything in this world and put it back into the order that will bring from God the glory that is due to him. And so these seven steps, these seven swords, we could reflect upon each and every one of them, as I did in the retreat, on an hourly basis, and always find more and more to them. But keep these key words in mind. First, anticipation. Second, detachment. Third, ah, abandonment. Fourth, silence. Fifth, the action, the crucifixion and the birth, the nuptials of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sixth, then we move into that which, which I call powerlessness, that which brings us to the great gift of the burial, and the burial, the explosion of God's divine love conquering everything that original sin has plagued us with throughout the ages of mankind. And so we hope that these reflections uh, help you realize that uh, your life will go through the same. My life is going through the same. And we are progressing. We are moving to, as according to the providence of God to our eternal destiny, the kingdom of heaven, where all the angels and saints are, are wishing and rooting us on and until that one day when we come to the fullness of our Blessed Mother's uh, true nature, and that is the glory of her coronation, becoming queen of heaven and earth, and in that, reflecting all the honor of the angels and saints who have accepted the will of God and said, said in, in their own hearts, in your will, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in your will is our peace. God bless you. Unbelievable talk, Father. Thank you very much. And wow, I don't even know where to begin. I'd, I'd like to have some follow-up thoughts here uh, on my end, if I, if I can real briefly, and then uh, you can kind of close it out with some uh, final thoughts and then a prayer. But yeah, I say this in my book as well, when, when we're thinking about it, you know, heaven came to us, Christ came to us through the through the womb of Mary, and it's ultimately going to be us going through the womb of Mary as well in union with Jesus uh, to get to heaven. So some really great um, analogies used by uh, Father in this talk. I hope you all meditate upon this 
talk. I, I have so many notes written down here. It's, it's really hard to, to really, you know, where do I go? I mean, it's just, there's a lot there to, to chew upon. Yeah, there's a lot of meat there crammed in one hour. Um, but yeah, for, first thought that co- comes to me for, for my own sake, you know, the, the prayers of a mother. And, uh, you know, we take a, a step back in society and, if, and take a look, you know, are our mothers doing this? Are our mothers turning to uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary for, first and foremost, the, the sake of conversions? And I know through my own mother, I, I know wholeheartedly that it was through her prayers going to the Blessed Virgin Mary that finally, uh, you know, our Lord and, and, and Our Lady tugged on my heart uh, and let me know, you know, I was on Hell's Highway and I had to to, to, to change course, basically. So we can look to those examples, St. Monica with, with St. Augustine. And so, you know, it's really hard to sit and listen to the Protestants who are always attacking her uh, in, in terms of intercession. And her role is has always been key in the church, but it's going to be magnified in this time period, which we are going through now, I would say, but it's only going to magnify as we head uh, more into this great storm coming. So that's the first thing yeah. is the prayers of a mother to, um, you know, placing ourselves under the mantle of Mary. Uh, you know, in my book, you know, I, I denote and, and the early church fathers as well as the great tree, paradise's tree that we eat off of. Well, we have to be like little flowers in humility planted underneath this tree. Uh, and, and it will protect us ultimately from those rays of justice. Another analogy that I use in my book, as these rays of justice are pouring down upon the earth, it will be through her intercession, her, um, you know, her protection that we are going to be protected by the divine, uh, wrath, the divine justice. So yeah, you mentioned, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the cloud of unknowing, which I, I read many years ago, unbelievable, great recommendation there for those going through the purification period and, just they're, they're lost. It's very it's very confusing times, um, you know, in the purification times. If, if you don't have, go ahead. That's the period of abandonment. Yeah. Where everything is, you, you're just confused, and people have to realize one of the problems we have in our educational program as Catholics is that we don't take the spiritual life and analyze what saints have done and what have gone from each and every one of them, and our Blessed Mother is the first. If, if we go to Dante, for instance, he took it seriously because he put on purgatory reins and whips, if you recall. And every whip, the, his first thing is the whip is the positive. Uh, you know, get going, let's get going. Point. The whip is meant to move us through the purification of the seven capital sins. And so Dante puts a whip and a rein. Uh, uh, several of them sometimes. Anyway, the first whip that he uses to get us moving in each one of the cases is an example from our Blessed Mother's life. So, for the, the cornice of pride, here she begins with the Annunciation. And so you have to have seven steps right there. And it's the same with every saint that our Blessed Mother becomes the model. Once our Blessed Mother becomes the model and we just turn over everything to her, then uh, everything will flow. Just be yeah. patient, you know, but yeah. it will come. And that's why I say, you know, uh, the cloud of unknowing is an example of that as, as well. Yeah, he, he who is closest to the Mother is assuredly closest to the Son, as the saints say. Um, so make sure you're, you're placing yourself not only near Mary, but in Mary. Um, you know, we go, th- we go to the sacred heart through the immaculate heart, but getting back to the, you know, the cloud by day by the, you know, the fire by night, you know, we're about to enter into the great storm, as I call it, the great test, you know, a, a great, uh, fiery period of trial. And so, yes, at night it's, it's going to be a, a dark night and on a more grand mm-hmm. scale, you're going to see souls enter into the dark night. I mean, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of confused people. They're not going to know where to turn because they can't turn to their bank account. They can't turn to their homes. They can't turn to, you know, I would even argue human relationships because a lot of people aren't going to be around. So they're going to sit on that aisle of silence that you talked about, which um, the the eagle of the, the apocalypse, uh, St. John, that's where he, he was on the Isle of Patmos, the Isle of Silence. And he wrote those wonderful uh, works. So also uh, three, third point, you know, see the world through Mary's eyes. 
And rather than try to see it through our own carnal eyes, we always have to stay in such a, a state of union with that Immaculate Heart that we're seeing every situation through her eyes. Um, so that was a you know another point that I had for as a model. Again, you, you hit on on you know everything that we need to talk about. I just wanted to highlight you know faith because that's a key component to this apostle. It's right on our website. You know, fear or faith. What are you going to choose? Self love. Or selflessness. So Mary is that perfect model of faith, right? Fiat, but then also of selflessness. So we have to choose that faith in, in our everyday lives. But on, on again, on a more grand scale with this great test coming, we have to constantly choose faith. No, we're not going to die today. No, we're not going to, you know, and think the worst. We always run to the worst in, in, in these situations. And we can't do that. We have to rely upon, um, you know, the virtue of faith. But then also purity for for. My work, and as many of you know, you know, I get really hard on a lot of these ladies that I work with in the adult business and the adult world, but it's all out of love. It's all out of charity because they're so blinded and they don't have direction from their own parents. I mean, their own parents are not giving them direction. So who, who is providing them uh, uh, um, some straight guidance? And, you know, oftentimes the, the rod of correction needs to come out and it's sometimes love is, is violent in that sense. And so purity, you know, purity's path is is uh, one that is necessary. Of course, we know from Scripture, um, you know, we can't see the face of God without it. And so Mary is uh, obviously a, a model of that. Fifth, as you mentioned, mediatrix of, of all graces, but Mary co-redemptrix. That will that will be made a dogma of the Church, the fifth Marian dogma, after the chastisements right. in the Great Council to come, which will root out Vatican II. So people always come to me. Well. When, when will that take place? Uh, and, and, and that will happen after these chastisements. But yeah, it's it's been taught in the early church. It's, it's taught in tradition. It's just not been formalized yet as such uh, in a council. And then also uh, call to mind, you know, in these times, and I'm sure, Father, you have a lot of individuals coming to you. If they can't get to, to Mass uh, for that week or some people even for a month or so, we've we got to remember that, Grace still runs through the church and through Our Lady, so we still have to sanctify, you know, that Sunday or that Holy Day of Obligation. But we have to remember that's that's why we have to stay so close to the Rosary and the Immaculate Heart, because it's my opinion, it's strictly my opinion, and I, I think a lot of uh, traditional uh, traditionalists will agree with me, priests or otherwise, that the trend is moving away from buildings now to where masses and sacraments will be more in homes, dens, caves, as as the early Church Fathers teach. So those opportunities to get to the sacraments are going to be more limited, I think. I don't want to say they're going to be done with all altogether across the board. That's impossible. We know the, the church is divine. But it's going to be pretty bleak. And so we have to remember that's, that's why we have to develop that relationship now uh, and spread that uh, devotion to the Immaculate and Sacred Hearts. You know, I had a talk this past week. I covered Blessed Aiello's revelations. And over and over again, that's what the Blessed Virgin Mary said to her. And she talked about these chastisements to come, the fire from heaven. Spread forth and evangelize the devotion to the Immaculate Heart. Over and over again, all of these messages for a period of about 10 years. Uh, sixth point I wanted to, to make was, you mentioned, of, of course, this, this whole talk is about uh, sorrows, uh, the seven sorrows. But we can go to Scripture, Matthew 24, the beginning of sorrows, as our Lord said. So th now is the time to unite our hearts in with that sorrow with our Blessed Virgin Mary. Because on many fronts, I mean, we take a look around at the world. As you said, error begets death. The Second Vatican Council, objectively speaking, is leading souls into hell. It's not leading souls to uh, heaven. So we know a lot of souls are being lost on that level. And so... We have, uh, if you will, as you said, sorrow before the resurrection, before this eventual rebirth, however you want to say it, restoration. So there's always that period, uh, you know, the, the church going through the passion, if you will. And Our Lady stood by that cross. We have to remember, very few stood by that cross. And so are people going to cave in? Are they going to cave into the new religion? Are they going to run from the cross? Or are they going to stay put next to Mary? Right. And stay firm and say, no, I'm not giving up the faith. You know, I'm not going to go along with this nonsense. All religions are united. However, the new age religion puts it. So that's kind of another Eric, analogy I wanted to say. Go ahead, Father. Uh, Eric, Eric, there's something I think others need to realize, too. When we said that the error begets death and so forth, 
error also begets a moral life that is out of order. And we see what's taking place in the church in regards to uh, sexual orientation yeah. and to marriage and so forth. In other words, the morals are completely going contrary to the words of God because the knowledge or the teaching is in error. So you have to see that connection as well. Yeah, great point. Yeah, it's, everything's just inverse now. Not everything, but the majority of, of what's coming from the conciliar church is just completely inverse from scripture and tradition. And so hopefully, you know, we have to continue to pray that more and more souls wake up. And again, as, as Father mentioned, the ultimate aims, you know, Father's work of this apostle is the saving of souls. I mean, that, that's it. We're, we're trying to cause awareness. We're trying to get people properly educated in the proper faith, not the Novus Ordo religion. And uh, so that's what we have to pray for. And of course, the Blessed Virgin Mary is instrumental. And the last point I just wanted to point out, obviously, this intimate union between the Immaculate and Sacred Heart. And we have uh, a quote from St. Bernard who said, The sword would not have reached Jesus if it had not pierced Mary's heart. Mary loved souls on Calvary. After suffering such cruel torments, she merited to be uh, the mother of all mankind. And then we had St. Ambrose said, Behold this heart which has so greatly loved all people that it spared nothing from them. Again, speaking to her selflessness. So Mary, that model of, of faith, and that's what we're going to need as eagles in this time. That's why I keep saying spread your, your eagle's wings in faith and hope because that's all you're going to have. It's not going to be <laughs> your bank account. It's not going to be you know how many pallets of Cheerios you got stored down in your basement. It's, you know, do you have a strong uh, and intimate connection with the Immaculate Heart that runs perfectly in tune uh with the, the the sacred heart so father i mean yeah again I, I thank you for that talk i know we got to get going here but why don't you give us some final thoughts and a prayer and we'll close it out well the first thing i would ask the people do is to enter more deeply into the word of god as our blessed mother because it is the word of god that when we perceive it on our own when we begin to realize it that begets in us the mind of Christ, and the mind of Christ then begets the actions of Christ. So if uh, our Blessed Mother is our example, she treasured every word, because one of the things I would have liked to have done too is, uh, and we should do it in the next broadcast, sure. is the seven words, the seven words that Our Lady spoke in Scripture. She doesn't speak a lot, but she gives us seven words that help us understand how we are to live in this world with her son. So if we can encourage everyone to enter into that silence every day and pray over the words of the Gospels, uh, the Holy Ghost will certainly do his work and beget in you that spirit of Our Lady, that spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we encourage you in that and we pray for you and offer sacrifice. And that is where you as a Catholic can move as well. I've mentioned it several times, and it's been a big thing for me that every day I want to sacrifice, Lord, that I might save a soul. Show me the sacrifice. And it'll come in driving a car. It'll come in uh, dealing with a baby or a kid. It'll come in all kinds of different ways, but there'll be a sacrifice, and you must begin to interpret it as the means that God the Father uses to save a soul. And we'll see those souls when we ourselves pass from this world to our particular judgment. And so let us ask our blessed mother to give us hearts like hers, contemplative. And let us ask her to guide each and every thought, word, and deed that we do in preparation for the kingdom of heaven. And let us pray. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought to play intercession. Unaided, inspired with his confidence, we find the over of her virgin my mother. Before the weak of the sinful and soft, O Mother Bird, be incarnate. Despise not my petitions, but in your mercy to hear and answer me. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mother of sorrows, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Well, thank you, Father, for coming on, taking time out, and giving us this wonderful talk. I know that many, all those who listen to this, will be blessed by it, will circulate this, 
as quickly as we can. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, be sure to wear your scapular. Be sure to pray the rosary daily and uh, stay close to the Immaculate Heart. Faith and hope is what's going to survive in the end. Have your eyes wide open in charity as an eagle. And until next time, stay safe and God bless.